1 Kings 18. It's a wonderful passage about Elijah. It's a wonderful passage about a man who's standing for God in a time of terrible apostasy amongst the people of God. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab and there was a severe famine in Samaria. And Ahab had called Obadiah who was in charge of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For so it was, while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them 50 to a cave and had fed them with bread and water. And Ahab had said to Obadiah, Go into the land to all the springs of water and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass to keep the horses and mules alive so that we will not have to kill any livestock. So they divided the land between them to explore it. Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah went another way by himself. Now as Obadiah was on his way, suddenly Elijah met him and he recognised him and fell on his face and said, is that you, my Lord Elijah? And he answered him, it is I. Go tell your master, Elijah is here. So he said, how have I sinned that you are delivering your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to hunt for you. And when they said he is not here, he took an oath from the kingdom or nation that they could not find you. And now you say, go tell your master Elijah is here and it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from you that the spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place I do not know. So when I go and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. But I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Was it not reported to my Lord that what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid 100 men of the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave, and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go tell your master, Elijah is here. He will kill me. Then Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. Then it happened, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled, troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire. He is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first. For you are many and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning even to till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. 
And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating or, or he's busy or he's on a journey or, or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two seers of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood and said, Fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. What wonderful motive. For a miracle that you have turned their hearts back to you again then the fire of the lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench now when all the people saw it they fell on their faces and they said the lord he is god the lord he is god and elijah said to them seize the prophets of baal do not let one of them escaped, so they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. So he went out and looked and said, There's nothing. And seven times he said, Go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain so Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel may the Lord add his blessing add his mercy to that wonderful reading of God's word. Father, we pray that you will help us to know the times. The Lord, Lord, that we will be able to look further than society. That we will be able to look further than the great achievements of today. That we will be able to look further than science and technology and entertainment and all the wonders of this world Lord that were denied previous generations and help us to see the cesspool, the pit, the filth and help us to see that God is in our midst and help us to have the faith to believe
believe and realize that our God is a God who answers by fire. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This is a, a, a wonderful chapter. Um, great chapter of faith. One of the great faith chapters in the Bible. And um, the, 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 one of the reasons it's, it's so wonderful is that um, it, it doesn't get worse than this. This is a nation in absolute apostasy. This is in a, a nation that is in rejected the, the true God and is worshipping the gods that they are forbidden to worship. And they think that they can get away with it. They, they think that by, by worshipping the gods of Baal as well as the Lord, that uh, somehow that will be okay. It is syncretism of the worst kind. And Elijah is a prophet. He's very unpopular. What prophet wasn't? What prophet isn't? He was very unpopular. But he's a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. And, you know, this is the divided kingdom. After Solomon, the kingdom's divided between the, the uh, kingdom of, of, of Israel, the northern kingdom, um, which was never any good, and the kingdom of Judah, where you had the odd good king. But um, uh, you know, Israel was never the same after, after Solomon. And Elijah is a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel, which, as I said, is in a terrible spiritual state. Baal worship introduced and, and, and propagated by the wicked queen Jezebel has swept over the people of God. She's killing the prophets, she's killing the men of God, um, and she's exercising a tremendous um, uh, um, a power over the, the nation and uh, the godly people are going through great persecution Baal worship and Ahab is the king he's, he's weak he's carnal uh, he's compromising and he's more afraid of his wife than he is of God he's more afraid of Jezebel than he is of God's prophet He's under Jezebel's control and he wants to kill Elijah as he killed the prophets. The nation is under a dreadful yoke of sin and depravity. When I was recently in the Philippines, I was asked um, uh, a question that was a very honest question. And it was a question from one of the leaders of the uh, Reformed Philippine Baptist churches that I visited and, and they said is Norway in apostasy is the Norwegian church a church in apostasy um, and uh, no, I, I'm English I'm very polite okay so I kind of um, I fudged it you know I, I, because I don't know I don't know whether Norway or Britain or Western Europe or, 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 or the Western world is in a state of apostasy. I don't know whether it's as bad as 1 Kings, as 1 Kings chapter 18. But I do know that today's Christian church, certainly in the, in the West, is in a dreadful state of worldliness and sin and the tragedy is we don't know it that is the tragedy we don't know it I only touch three generations the generation before me my own generation and the generation that is coming after me but I've seen the most drastic changes in the church I used to honestly believe, until maybe 15 years ago, that the, the, the church in apostasy, the church that, that, that the Lord will spew out of his mouth, I thought it was the liberal church. 
I really did. I thought it was the church, you know, the, the, I thought it was those churches. I never ever thought I would say it about the evangelical church. I never thought I would say it about us if we want to identify ourselves with our generation. It's in a dreadful state of worldliness and sin. And I am in a dreadful state of worldliness and sin. So you don't think that it, this is a, you know, a, a, an us and them or a me and you a situation. It is time for the Christian church to awaken and rise up to meet the need of the hour. Because as I said, they have declared war on the church. They have declared war on us. But we don't want war. We want peace. And it's quite understandable, but it's quite wrong. I was reading Tozer the, the, the other evening, and it's about the third time I've read the, the, the chapter, and he said, we live in a state of emergency. We live in a state of emergency. And he said, we've lived in a state of emergency since the fall of Adam and Eve. No matter how bad things look, we have the God of Elijah and we can say with Elijah and the God who answers by fire he is God verse 21 verse 21 and Elijah came to all the people and said how long will you falter between two opinions if the Lord is God follow him but if Baal follow him be a man, be a woman of one opinion. Be firm, be strong, be committed, be passionate, be hungry, be thirsty. Be certain about God. Be bold, be strong. Don't falter, don't doubt. Don't doubt the love of God. Don't doubt the power of God. Don't doubt his ability to raise up a generation of fine, young, committed, hungry, thirsty, passionate Christians out of the dust. He always does it. He did it at the Reformation. He did it in the 1750s. He did it in the 1850s. He did it in 1904 in Wales. And he did it in 1949 in the Hebrides Islands. He raises revival out of the dust. And he raises up a generation out of the dust, out of nothing, out of nowhere. Be certain, be bold, be strong, don't falter. Never doubt his ability to deliver. Never doubt his might. Never doubt the victory of the cross because we are of the New Testament and everything I am saying is centred in Christ. It's all centred in Jesus, not in the prophet Elijah. We have to realise this. This is gospel. This is gospel. Never doubt the might of Jesus Christ to save, to deliver. Christ is Lord. Christ is King. No matter what it looks like, Christ will be victorious. That's why we are to be of good cheer. But we need to wake up and see this world for what it is. Love not the world. And that's not so easy today. But because it was easy to say that in the 1750s. You didn't have anything. You know, you just about barely survived. You could say in the 1850s when revival broke out, you could say, love not the world. And, you know, you look around and you've got a few sticks to burn in your little, little wooden house and, you know, maybe a few turnips and a couple of potatoes. And, uh, and you know, and it was struggle. Life was a struggle. Life was a struggle. Life was a... It isn't anymore. And so it's... It's getting harder to raise up a generation. There will never 
doubt that being a Christian, being of Christ, is everything. The world can give nothing. The world cannot add. Because God cannot add. God has done it all. And Christ is Lord. And Christ is King. And we are his people. But we need to recognise the times we live in. We are at war. When I knew that what I was going to preach on, uh, um, you know, I, I was looking at different things, mainly the Bible. But I have to admit, I went to one of my, my heroes. I went to Winston Churchill. And I looked at his, some of his rhetoric, some of his speeches. You know, we will fight them on the beaches. We will, we will fight them. We will never give in. We will never give up. So inspiring. Now, maybe this is their finest hour. Okay, I don't want to be Churchillian, but you know, maybe this is our finest hour. Completely alone. Really not knowing how things were going to turn out. And he said, we will fight them in the beach. We'll, we'll fight them in the fields. We, we will never surrender. Oh, cannot we say that? Much, much more, because we know how it turns out. We know there is no doubt. We know Christ is victorious and will be victorious and we will be victorious with him. But we are at war. As I said, Tozer put it this way, we live in a state of emergency. Oh, I really, really love Tozer. We're facing a terribly hostile world. You know, my introduction, which isn't, you know, being recorded, it shows how hostile the world is becoming. A world that is showing increasing hatred towards Christians. And they have the law on their side. Well, they always have had. You know, the, the persecuted Christians in, in Rome, uh, you know, their, their persecutors had the law on their side. They, they, they had the politicians on their side. They had power and might on their side. But it's crucial in these days that a strong church of Jesus Christ should rise up to meet the need of the hour. We need spiritual eyes. The Bible says that the, 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 the unsaved man, he, he cannot receive the things of the Spirit. But we can. We have the mind of Christ. We should be able to see what they're trying to do. We should be able to see how they're trying to make us weak and woolly by offering us the world, by offering us good things, attractive things, entertaining things. But we should see through it. Because this is war. And it really is crucial. The evangelical church today cannot afford to be weak. It cannot afford to be split. It cannot afford to be divided. When Queen Esther rose up finally and was willing to pay the, the price to save her nation, she called everyone to prayer. And we need a united church. It doesn't mean we have to give up any of our own you know, beliefs and we do it this way and we believe this type of baptism we believe God saves this way but we need to get to a condition where we say Arminian do you love the Lord Jesus Christ are you concerned about the lost do you want to rise up then join us Pentecostal, do you feel the same? Baptist, do you feel the same? Reform, do you feel the same? Because we are tearing each other apart over what Lloyd-Jones called non-essentials of our faith. And we may be right. We may be absolutely right. We may be terribly right. And yet, we hope our satisfied 
with an evangelical church that's split and divided. I want to have fellowship with him. I want to have fellowship with her. Until she sees my way. Until he sees my way. I think we are right, by the way, but, you know, that's beside the point. Much of the church is covered with blessings and prosperity, as if, you know, uh, that is the, the whole message of the cross. Blessed coming in and blessed going out and blessed here and blessed there and all. Bless me, bless me, bless me. So much of the church has fallen for it. That is the world. That's not the blessing of the word of God. The word of God, the, 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 the blessings are conditioned. Some of the greatest blessings that, that, that believers have received has been through martyrdom. Now, I, I don't want that blessing, so don't get me wrong. I'm not to, but, 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 but others have had it and others have real, realised that this is the greatest blessing. Look at Stephen as they're stoning him. He's not saying, oh, I'll never have that Mercedes now. Not, I'll, I'll never have that big house now. He saw heaven opened. And he saw the Lord. And even in death, he saw a God who answers by fire. Others are copying all the ways and the strategies of the world. See how, you know, we need a business method for our church. We, you know, we need to do it this way. We need to do it that way. And meanwhile, much of the evangelical church is, is satisfied with, with sound doctrine but lacks a true understanding of the person and the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. Thinking that doctrine is enough, doctrine will not get us out of this state of weakness. Only a Holy Spirit revival in our hearts will do that. And you know how much I love sound doctrine. Oh, I'm, I just love it. But many of us who are absolutely you know, sound in our doctrine, we have little concern for the lost. And I believe that since the days of the Reformation, the church has never been weaker. But we are so ripe for revival. Because we, we're either going to be completely destroyed, which is uh, impossible because the word of God goes against that, or we are going to be revived. And when Christ comes, he's coming for a pure and a mighty and a glorious church. But we mustn't be pacifists. We... We don't want war, no one wants war. But we mustn't seek terms of peace with the enemy. We're not called to surrender to the enemy. We're not even called to offer peace terms to the enemy. We are called to stand against the enemy. As I said, like, like Britain before the Second World War, we're seeking peace in our time. Not coming back from Munich with a piece of paper saying peace in our time. I have a piece of paper here. But maybe spiritually, we're seeking peace in our time. And there will be many, many opportunities to compromise. You don't need to be as fanatic. You can just give a little. Can't you understand? Just give a little. Don't be like Elijah. You don't need to be like Elijah. Not exactly. And there will be many, many opportunities to compromise. But we are already at war. It's too late for compromise. And it's too late for peace. And I already see things that I wouldn't have believed possible 20, 30 years ago. Certainly when I got saved in 1970. I wouldn't have thought it possible. The millions and millions and millions of unborn children will be sacrificed to the modern Molech or Baal. 
I never really understood how we were getting to these times where the word of God says, you know, thou call. Thou call the wrong things right and right things wrong. We're already at war. They declared war when they said that an unborn baby doesn't have life. They know an unborn baby has life. Every mother feels the baby kicking. It is too horrific for words. We are already at war with a furious and hostile enemy who will delight in weakening us. And if this enemy doesn't weaken us, it will try to crush us. Let us just briefly look at some of the details contained in this wonderful chapter. Verse 24. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire. He is God. We have a God who answers by fire. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. If we want to see victory against the enemy, we are going to have to repair God's altar. The altar of prayer that lies in ruins. The altar of biblical truth which lies rejected in the dust where we live in a generation where every man every every man every woman does what seems right in their own eyes i make up my own theology i make up my own doctrine the altar of biblical truth lying neglected the altar of prayer lying in ruins the altar of purity and godly living you get saved and the first question you ask is uh, can i do that can i do this can I watch horror movies? Of course you can. Of course you can. You know, uh, I know God can, you know, strike you with lightning or, uh, but, but, but he, he doesn't, you know. He gives us a great, he gives us great freedom. Not always to sin, but to compromise and to steal our time. Television steals your time. The altar of purity and, and, and godly living. The altar of holiness. Living in the Bible, of course, but also living in um, J.C. Ryle's book on holiness. Sproul's book on the holiness of God. Living in holiness and learning from other great men and great women about holiness. The altar of holiness needs to be repaired. The altar of the Christian Sunday, the Christian Sabbath. It stands in judgment against us modern Christians who dare to defy and break the fourth commandment, which is so clear. There are ten commandments, not nine. So many Christians argue today that the fourth commandment is not for Christians. But it, it's just ridiculous means that we, we we have ten commands and we we live under the nine we don't even keep those but uh, we, we simply just don't want a Christian Sunday there's an altar to restore we are at war and the prayer altar must be restored as I said in one generation the world has turned to mass murder of babies in the womb. Millions and millions of them. The laws of God are mocked and despised. And so we shall be as well. There's a growing hostility towards any man or woman who believes that marriage can never be between two men or two women. And you will go to prison for it. That time will come. That time will come. Because it is a very militant movement. Because it is not a movement of men and women. It is a movement of the evil one. It is satanic. 
in a very short time that will be against the law to stand against the murder of the unborn child, marriage between homosexual and lesbian couples. We will either accept the laws of the land or go to prison for those views. Or, as I think many churches will do, unless revival comes, compromise. You know, you, you compromise. Little, little baby steps. You don't, you don't go, uh, you know, don't, you, you don't, don't go complete. That, the enemy doesn't do it that way. The enemy comes with something that seems quite reasonable, you know, quite reasonable. And then they get the foothold. And then it goes to the next step, and the next step, and the next step, until New York now, you can have an, an abortion up to the time of delivery. They, did, they would never have got that through. But you just go, little steps, little steps. That's the enemy. That's the enemy. And we have to be, sometimes, like the enemy. God spoke to the church in Laodicea, which I really thought at one time was, you know, those, those liberals who don't believe in the Trinity and don't believe in the deity of Christ, and not anymore. God spoke to the church in Laodicea with a terrible warning, Revelation 3.17. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Oh, what a difference. The church at Laodicea, thinking, I'm rich, I've become wealthy. I have need of nothing. But the Spirit of God says, you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. Not with physical deprivation, but with terrible spiritual poverty. Let this never be said of us. May we always be poor in spirit and hungry of heart for God. May we always be thirsting for more of Jesus. The cross before me, the world behind me. Let that not just be the song that we sing at baptisms, and I love that song. The cross before me, the world behind me. May we always be thirsting for more. Verses 36 and 37, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your ser servant. And we come to some wonderful, wonderful heart uh, purity of the prophet here. And that I have done these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. That was the motive for the miracle. That was the motive for the prophet. Not that he could then boast of the miracle and become the miracle man and 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 you know earn become a millionaire from it he did the miracle as christ did his miracles with a very distinct and wonderful purpose and elijah's purpose was a prayer and God, that you have turned their hearts back to you again. May the people see and may, be, may they know that God, Lord, you've turned their hearts back to you again. And while we maybe are critical of the church today and sections of the church today and, 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 and we, you know, we're very vehement, <laughs> may it not be a critical spirit, may it not be a judgmental spirit. May we all realise that there, for, but for the grace of God, there for the grace of Jesus Christ, I would be there. I would be doing that. I would be there. But let our prayer, if we can think of some of those groups today that we feel have fallen from you know, their first love, they've fallen from 
great height. And today, um, I'm just a shadow of a gospel preaching church. Let us pray for them. Let us pray. Oh Lord, may it be said that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Let us pray that the hearts of those that are now preaching a false gospel will be turned back to God again. Let us not be judgmental. Let us not be critical. Let us not be hard and harsh as we stand for truth and as we are mourning over many of the things that we see in the churches today. But let us be gentle. Let us be loving. Let us be gracious and graceful in everything that we do. So that our words maybe will cut into the heart but will not destroy. Verses 38 and 39, 38, 39. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Elijah had prayed. The, the God who answers by fire, he is God. And now the people are saying, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. There's now no doubt in their hearts. Oh, what a shame that they didn't have that faith before. Verses 42 to 43. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground and he put his face between his knees. What a prayer. What a, what a prayer posture. He bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and he looked and he said, There is nothing. And Elijah, with his, with his face in his knees, bowed down on the ground, prays seven times, seven times. Go again. And he's praying. And he comes out, there's nothing, Lord, there's nothing. Go again, go again. And seven times. He said, go again. And then, wonderfully, verses 44 to 46. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud, as small as a man's hand, rising out of the water. And... It's only a cloud. It's only a cloud the size of a man's hand. It's not very promising. It doesn't get much smaller than the size of a man's hand. I suppose it looks bigger than that, but you know, from your know, perspective, you know, it looked the size of a, of, a, of, a, of a man's hand. But Elijah, a man of faith, he says, "Go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you." It's only the size of a man's hand. But to Elijah, this is God. This is the Lord. This is his doing. And very soon there will be rain on the land again. And we need to prepare for it. So, so tell Ahab to, to, to prepare his chat, chat and, and go down before the rain stops him. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Do you know, in a revival, it doesn't begin big. It's just, it's just a cloud the size of a man's hand. And it just begins to water. In, in Cambuslang, outside Glasgow, we, you know, we, we, we credit Whitfield quite rightly with, the, with, with, with the, the revival there. And they were having services four, five, six times the population of Glasgow. You know, people used to travel a hundred miles to a service in Wales. 
it would take them two or three days. You know, the 100 miles a day is uh, you know, a couple of hours by, you know, uh, in the car, but, um, but it would take them days. But there was a man called McCullough, and he was the, he was the, 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 the pastor of the church in Camberstown. Before Whitfield came, he began to see miracles. And about 30, 40, 50 young people got saved in Canberra before Whitfield came. And when he had about 50 new converts, I mean, great tears, tremendous burden of sin. These were real old time religion, Christian conversions. And when he got to about 50, he sent for Whitfield. And he said, you know, man of God, come and help us. Come and help us. Because Whitfield was the great evangelist. But before Whitfield ever hit Canberra, some, before he, he ever came, and he was still in London having wonderful meetings. There was already a cloud the size of a man's hand in Canberra, showering the church, showering blessings as people came to Christ in Wonderful, wonderful conversions. We only need a cloud the size of a man's hand. And God will do the rest. We do live in desperate times. But the prophet saw a cloud. No bigger than a man's hand. It was tiny, but it was enough. It was a new beginning. Or may there be a new beginning in our time. May we see revival again. May I see it first in my heart. May I just know that God is reviving my heart. And may God revive all our hearts here today. We, we don't need a massive revival to start with. We just need something the size of a man's hand. Something to increase our faith. Something to give us hope. Some tangible evidence that God is still God and we are still his people. May we see revival again. Every revival begins with the tiniest of showers. It is just the way God works. But it has always led to a mighty flood of revival. Lord, visit us again as you did in times past. Lord, do it again. We have everything we need. God has nothing more to give this world. Nothing more to give the church. He gave his only son for sinners, and that was enough for us. He gave the Bible for us, and that is enough for us. He gave the Holy Spirit, not to give, you know, um, goosebumps alone he gave the Holy Spirit to convict man of sin and equip the church and every one of us who has been converted here today we know that the Holy Spirit convicted us of sin now, there is nothing else to give Jesus is the last word of God to man as I said, there is a desperate need for revival in the church. But with God, there is always cometh the hour, cometh the man. Cometh the hour, cometh the woman. I am um, going to close with um, a wonderful promise to the ladies. Or as Marilyn says, the women. The women of the church. Esther chapter 4. Verses 10 to 16. Esther chapter 4, verses 10 to 16. Now, now this is, this is a, a desperate time. Um, these are really desperate times. Um, Haman is planning, has purchased, uh, paid money for the extinction of the Jewish people. Mordecai, man of God, is standing for his nation, standing for the truth, standing 
for the word of God, standing for the promises of God, and he is going to be hung, and that is just the beginning, because uh, if Haman gets his way, the people of, of, of God will be completely extinguished. And here is Esther, the queen, quite rightly wavering a little bit. She's the queen, but, uh, you know, she's only the queen because she's very beautiful and the king uh, saw her and desired her and has her. She doesn't really have any power. And she can't even go and see the king unless he commands it. She can't... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, um, you are so much better off today. You know, you don't have to knock at your husband's office door and, and uh, with fear of death. You know, whether you can see your husband. You know, you just go in and say, "Okay, husband, uh, make me a cup of tea," and you know that that's it. But but here, she she couldn't even go to see the king. And and Mordecai is saying, Esther, you must go to the king. You must go to the king. Only you can save your people you are the queen esther you must go. but but she knew that she could, if if he if she goes to see him and he does not hold out the royal scepter he will have her head off she will be executed and and, she, and she, so she she quite understandably is she's nervous about this you know it's uh, it's something that is it, it's difficult for her. And then in verse 10, then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king, and that included the queen, who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. This is, this is immense, this is historic. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. That was Mordecai's faith. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows? Who knows, ladies? Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Go, gather all the Jews who are present in, in, in Shushan and fast for me. Prayer and fasting. Oh, pray for me, fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And these are the wonderful words of faith. And if I perish, I perish. And we know that she went into the king. He held out the, the, the scepter. Haman was hanged on the gallows that he thought Mordecai was going to be hanged on. The Jews were spared. And God answered with fire. Before there can be a revival, there must be a return to holy living. Before there can be a return to holy living, there must be repentance. There must be a return to Acts of the Apostles living. The situation today, it calls for Elijah's amongst the men and Esther's amongst the women. Men who know their God and cry, the God who answers by fire. He is God. Women who know their God and cry, if I perish, I perish, but I am not going to compromise. I'm not going to weaken. I'm going to stand for God, stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, stand for the gospel, stand for the cross. And if I perish, I perish. 
Because, dear Estes, you know you can't lose. You know, like the Apostle Paul, you don't know whether you'd rather be here or be with the Lord, which is much greater and much more glorious. This is not a, a time for negotiation with the enemy. I found that out last night. How have I been sleeping so badly? That, you know, sleeping so soundly, I should say, that I haven't realised that we are at war now. The enemy has struck. The enemy is powerful. It's a state of emergency. But we live under the new covenant. We live in the New Testament. Our hope and our faith rest in the gospel to change lives. Our faith is in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. It is that which has transformed our lives and it is the same gospel and the same cross that will change lives today. I pray that we will very soon see spiritually in the Holy Spirit a cloud no bigger than a man's hand and that we will begin to pre prepare for a new day in our land for a revival the first for many 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 years but we have a God who answers by fire he answered the problem of our sin by fire by power he sent the Lord Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins in our place, that we would be truly converted and transformed so that we would live not as weak or apostate Christians, but as powerful, loving and victorious Christians until we either Go home to be with the Lord, or the Lord comes to take us home with himself. Father, we thank you for the gospel. Lord, we, we don't want to be ignorant of the times that we live in, and Lord, we, we don't want to be pessimistic either, because we know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your promises are the same, yesterday, today, and forever and Lord we thank you that you are a God whose arm is not shortened to save and we know Lord that you're going to save many before you come again one day Lord we will have that rest one day Lord there will be no war whether physical or spiritual but until that day comes we pray, Lord, that you will find us faithful and joyful and holy and loving and victorious in the cross of Jesus Christ, which we ask in your precious name. Amen.